Could an envelope cure cancer? Three years ago, I had a great deal of problems that I was considering and that was on my mind. And if you were able to go in and take a picture of my mind, it would have looked something like this. I had six items. We were continually contemplating. These items were broken up into two big categories. On the left, I was the medical director of one of the biggest insurers in the nation, and my job was to, ter to determine when new testing could be introduced into patients in a way that would help improve their diagnosis or their treatment. When I was working in that position, I had the opportunity of working with many other groups. On the right side, I, also, I was the medical director of a cancer, the, the Teton Cancer Institute, taking care of cancer patients. Now let me drill down to the individual groups I was working with. First, I was working with this large insurance company. And that insurance company was always worrying about how do we improve the quality of the care of our patients? How do we help them live longer or feel better? How do we decrease cost? I had the opportunity of working with the pharmaceutical industry, and the pharmaceutical industry had all these treatments that were sitting in their vaults saying, we have new things that are available but we have to show that they're effective. And the problem was, is there just wasn't enough patience to which they could try these treatments to find whether or not these drugs or these interventions would help. We had laboratories that were advancing technology that is just amazing. Technology that, if implemented, could really help us understand how to diagnose and cure diseases that we only could have dreamed about years before. Lastly, there was the Food and Drug Administration who was saying, we need high quality, we need safety. We need to make sure that everything works. Now, I was also very much worried about the, all my own patients that I was seeing in the clinic every day. Sadly, in my own clinic, I have a great deal of patients that I know that there is no real good option for them, that they would die from their disease. In fact, you know that this year, 580,000 patients will die from cancer. That's 1,600 people a day will die from cancer. Also in my mind was this whole idea of how do we decrease healthcare cost. The average cost of taking care of cancer patient, several hundred thousand dollars per year. We have treatments that one dose of treatment can be thirty to forty thousand dollars, and yet these treatments, in many cases, could only buy a patient a little bit longer time. Now, at the center of all this was another issue, and it was we need more information. Information is power. Information helps us know who can we benefit from what types of treatments. And the problem was, is that the information that existed was either not being collected or what it was being done is that information was being taken and taken by groups and it was being hidden away because it was valuable and people wanted to make a profit from it. Or a group would say, I don't want this data to come out because there's information that I could use to publish and increase my prestige. And so this data was locked up that was impeding this whole entire area. Now, let me get a little personal. This dear, sweet, beautiful lady is one of my patients. Her name is Deb. Around three years ago, when I was contemplating all these issues, Deb came into my office. She had been seeing her, her uh, family physician for several weeks with some back pain. Initially, they thought it may have been just a simple pulled muscle. But as time went on, the physician ultimately ordered a CAT scan and showed that she had a spot in her lung. Not only were there spots in her lungs, there were spots all throughout her spine her pain was not caused by a muscle pull. It was caused by advanced lung cancer. 48 years old, never smoked a day in her life, 
sitting with me with her dear husband, Mike, in my office saying, Dr. D, what does this mean? Do you know that most cancer patients with lung cancer will not make it more than two years? And the chances of being alive, even with the best treatments we have nowadays, is less than 10% chance you'll be around at five years. And there were Mike and Deb sitting in my office saying, Dane, what are you going to do? How can you help us? We'll do anything. So we put Deb on one course of chemotherapy, and it didn't work. And we put her on another course of chemotherapy, and that didn't work. And what we were left with was determining, was this dear woman going to be, like the averages say, someone that may not even make it two years with this disease? There was hope, however. Around this same time, there was some new information coming out that said, if we could identify certain characteristics about tumor, what we could do is we could potentially give treatments that targeted that tumor. We could personalize a treatment to the patient. We know that if we look, and if we have 100 patients that have lung cancer in this exact same place in their lungs, and if we look underneath the microscope, and we see they have the exact same you know, types of cells on the microscope, that if you go and dig deeper into the cells themselves, and you look at the DNA or the RNA that sits inside those cells, although the components are similar from cancer patient to cancer patient, they're arranged in a little different fashion. Every cancer patient's tumor is like a thumbprint. On the surface, very similar, but when you get to looking at it very closely, very different. And if we could get the information from understanding these differences, if we could put them together, we could start to understand how we could improve patients' treatments and their outcomes one by one. So in Deb's case, even though her insurance company would not pay for it, Mike and Deb said, is there a way we could test my tumor, her tumor, to see if there was any benefit from a different type of treatment? We did send her tumor specimen out, and lo and behold, there was a change in the DNA that was in such a way that we could treat her with a very specialized treatment. And we put her on a, a different type of treatment, and now, three years later, I talked to Mike and Deb two days ago, and they said, please tell everyone she's doing great. Now you may say, great end of the story. The problem is, is even with that treatment, eventually the disease will find a way around it. And Deb, unless we find different ways of treating her, will likely lose this battle. Now, what does this have to do with this envelope? I had been in meetings in my different responsibilities for over two years, and it was amazing to me how often problems were brought up in meeting after meeting after meeting. Everyone knew the problems very well, but no one seemed to have the solutions. And I remember I was sitting and I was on a phone call, and I took just a plain envelope that was a bill, and I just started writing on the back of the envelope, an idea that came to me and came to me in a, in, in, a, in a moment of clarity. And the idea was this. Take these six groups and bring them all together. Bring them all together so that they could work on unlocking this most important of problems of how we can, work, we can cure cancer and help solve each one of their problems. But in solving each one of their problems, ask them to give something in return. Insurance companies, would you be willing to pay for a genetic test for a patient with cancer? And the insurance companies would say, yes, we're willing to do that, as long as the laboratories would make sure that it was standardized and high quality. Patient, if you're receiving this um, testing, would you allow us to collect information about you and your tumor and your treatment? Physician, would you be willing to report that data? 
pharmaceutical company, would you be willing that you would find and identify new treatments for these patients and help to advance it? And lastly, Food and Drug Administration, would you help build the methodology that allows us to unlock new treatments and new diagnostic techniques? And in the process, what we do is we bring everyone together and we build this data set. A data set that is not controlled by one group or one individual or one for-profit company that wants to just take it and make money off of it, but make the data open for everyone to do research. And by doing so, every group would benefit. The insurer would get the information to know when a treatment is better, the patient would have better treatments, the physician would have better options, the pharmaceutical companies and the laboratory companies would benefit from advancing treatments, and we could together learn how to cure this horrible disease. Now, the idea sounds very simple. This is just one one-hour session of whiteboarding the ways of bringing this all together. Simple, but also complex at the same time, but doable. The idea being that if we started where we, what we, with what we know, and we collect information, we can, on a step-by-step-by-step-by-step -step 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 fashion, start taking this information and bringing people from a terminal diagnosis eventually to a cure. Now the problem was, is how do you make this happen? How can you pull everyone together to bring this about? As this idea was shared over three years ago with various different groups, we found that there were a great deal of people that were interested in it, but as we started looking for a group that could bring everyone together, it became clear that there was not a group that could do it. The problem was is that all these groups, these six groups, they worked with each other, but they weren't working together as closely as you would hope. Everyone in many ways wanted to have control. And so the group I was working with said, well, what we need is we need to bring them all together as a consortium where everyone is equal. And the consortium needs to be built so that we can collect the evidence in personalized or molecular medicine and we can develop these treatments. And when we couldn't find a group, we built something known as the Molecular Evidence Development Consortium. Now, it's not the group that matters. What matters is the idea of bringing people together so that we can unlock this information and we can find better treatments. As with any idea, there are obstacles. As we have started to share this idea with the nation, what we have seen is four of the major, the, four of the largest insurance companies in the nation have said, we're interested in supporting an idea like this. We've had several innovative companies say, we think this could be a good idea. But we've also had companies that have said, you know, we'll sit back and wait to see if it can be built before we want to support an idea like this. We've also had groups that have said things like, we don't want this to be built. Because if it gets built, the data that we want so badly to control will now be available for everyone. And so, as this has gone on, we've been able to start to build this consortium with the hope that it would act as a template where other groups or other nations could start to build similar consortium that together we could bring people into a place where all of this could be taken, aggregated, and learned from so that we could start to find an answer for cancer. Now, bring it back to my dear patient, Deb. Will the idea on this beaten up envelope lead to a cure for Deb and for Mike? I don't know. We have a long way to go. But what I'm absolutely convinced 
is the idea that was written on that envelope three years ago. If implemented across multiple groups, across countries, will lead to a cure to cancer. Not only for people like Deb, but for the millions of others that will follow after her. We just need to come together and get it done. Thank you.